Hello and welcome to the Iceberg of Finance Part 7. Thank you for joining me this far into the journey. Um, now we're kind of getting into some of the more outright conspiratorial aspects of finance. And I'm going to try to suss out which ones are have some basis behind them and which ones are just plain crazy and out in left field. Uh, and then after this, we have part eight, and then we're going to move on to more of our usual uh, analyzing finance with Nick content. But if you like this series, uh, please uh, tell me. And if I ever get to 10,000 plus subscribers, I will do a second iceberg of finance. But now let's get on with the topics. This next one I'm going to talk about is the barter myth, which is this idea that if money disappeared tomorrow, everybody would go back to bartering and before the invention of currency uh, the way that people exchange goods was via barter uh, for those who aren't familiar with the concept of bartering this is basically the idea if I for example wanted to get a pair of shoes instead of being able to pay hundred dollars for those shoes I would have to trade you 12 um, cartons of eggs or like 12 dozen would be 144 eggs and so and there, since there is no currency which is kind of a standard unit of account that people can use to buy other goods you'd have to directly offer that because say the shoe salesman doesn't need sh my, what I say for example I'm a candle maker um, and the shoe the cobbler doesn't need candles he only wants eggs and so therefore I would have to find somebody who I had trade my can egg farmer and trade my candles for his eggs and then go to the cobbler and trade the, the eggs for the shoes. You can see how this would be really inefficient and complicated and this is what the theory was is people thought would do direct exchange like that where it was not really the case that's why it's called the barter myth and the, our first idea I got on this book was called Debt the First 5,000 Years by David Graeber, which we'll talk about at the very bottom of this iceberg. And um, based on what his research and other economists that I've read about this is that it's not that barter was a first for currency. It's just that everybody just exchanged debt or IOUs. So, like, instead of, say, for example, the shoe guy doesn't need a candle from me, so instead he'd give me the pair of shoes, and if I ever needed something from him, if he ever needed candles from me, I would have to owe it to him at a future point, or a future, uh, when he would have to come and collect and I'd pay it back, or it, it could be denominated in wheat or eggs or whatever. It's that whenever I am able to exchange my goods and services for that, I will pay them. And basically, so it was kind of a giant bank. Everybody was kind of their own individual bank in a sense. This example, which I have to give credit to Patrick Boyle on this, was the bank strike in Ireland in the 70s where basically people would write checks and um, not be able to cash them. So they would just exchange future checks to each other on an honor system and the old debt system since there was no things such as credit scores or national records of people's purchases um, the only way that people would lend you money and do these agreements is if they knew you and villages were much smaller back then in towns and f rural communities so people did know you and so you had your, your own personal trust and honor was heavily valued back then and so if you were not if you were known to be a dishonorable person who didn't pay back your debts uh sorry you're not going to have buy any food this is where there's the evolutionary perspective and the religious perspective of the importance of honesty and integrity which i think are important on their own individual merits but from an economic perspective this was the original ancient civilization reason why they were so important because Pretty much every sort of economic transaction was dependent on the trustworthiness and the um, personal honor that 
people in the society have and why honor culture does remain stronger now in less economically developed and less technologically advanced societies because that's the only way you can verify them. And as we've advanced in technology and the financial system has gotten more sophisticated, it's gone always more from trust-based to um, decentralized, non-trust-based systems. Like the whole appeal for cryptocurrencies is that um, and decent is that you don't have to trust a bank or a counterparty, uh, but at the same time, people I think that one of the flaws of 21st century millennial thinking is that a lot of people don't undervalue the importance of trust and relationships, whether in building a business or um, just functioning as a member of a modern of society, and how your life can be a lot easier if you develop credibility whether it's on your workplace or your town or um, your school or whatever, as an honorable person, that actually still means something, even in a world that's trying to remove trust out of the equation in any way they can. Uh, if, unless if we come all digital automatons who never talk to anybody in person anymore, then I think that we can learn something from the Botter myth and about the importance of trust in society about Joseph Kennedy Sr., who was the father of John F. Kennedy, the president, JF, um, JK, sorry, RFK, Robert Kennedy, his brother, who was former attorney general, and Senator Ted Kennedy. And the thing, the story, why he's in the iceberg of finance is how um, he made his money. Uh, he made his money primarily through financial speculation. In the 20s, he made a fortune in trading stocks, commodity futures, and he also, um, on top of that, uh, was one of the most notable short sellers during the 1929 crash. And he made a lot of money um, shorting stocks in 1929. Um, uh, by the end of by 1935, 1929, before the crash, his fortune was four million dollars, in terms of sixty million today's money. By 1935, in the heart of the Great Depression, his wealth had increased to 180 million, or 3.4 billion today. So it's interesting that one of the most famous political dynasties in the history of the United States of America was made on the backs of a short seller. And short sellers are vilified and people hate them so much yet our most beloved president are not I'm not saying he's my favorite president but one of the most beloved presidents in the history of America was um, the son of a speculator who financed his children's political ambitions through money made short selling and pre and there's a lot of stuff was before the ad, the advent of the SEC and a lot of the other um, regulations that we now have in the securities market. So it is questionable, like in today's era, how legal some of the stuff he did would have been, like such as bear raids um, or tactics that would be considered insider trading and market manipulation by today's standards, such as brokerage firm in the, in the 20s. Uh, he later would diversify this money into other assets such as in the real estate, the shipping industry, and in the movie theaters industry as well. So a lot of people like to think that um, his um, money was made by the bootlegging, but there really is no evidence to truly confirm that. In fact, really, his money was made through short selling. And it's also kind of ironic because of the way he acquired his wealth is that he became the SEC chairman. Um, I think the first SEC chairman in its history in 1934 and did that for a year. That, that, yeah, also, that on the, on the, I could see why FDR would put him there, not just because he was a prominent supporter, but also was because like the SEC's job is to regulate and clean up the financial industry and 
somebody who would know about this is a participant. So he would actually probably be the right guy by that logic to pick to help get the SEC off the ground. Uh, so yeah, that's the story of the Kennedy family and where their money came from. It's a lot more linked to financial markets than people believe. 14 up, 14 down come from a concept from economist Philip Anderson, who is noteworthy for his book, The Secret Life of Real Estate and Banking, which I highly recommend, which shows that uh, real estate historically goes in patterns that average 14 years of up market followed by a four year crash. And with the exception of the post-World War II boom, which had some delays due to just the general rebuilding of the global economy. This pattern has held up extremely well in Anglosphere countries, especially the United States. Like I'll attach a link to an image of Chicago real estate basically since the 1830s. And this pattern has been remarkably robust and has continued to do so. Uh, there's, there's a lot of theories on why this works due to just people's comfort with credit but a lot of it comes down to the fact that most professionals in the real estate business or speculators usually do not have a career that lasts long enough to cover two full 18 year cycles or 36 years especially today where the average person changes jobs or careers multiple times in a decade um, there's not that many people who last 36 years in any industry, particularly as one is highly speculative and a lot of leverage is real estate. And so they say everybody who's remembered to live through a two whole cycles uh, in the past is probably no longer in the game. And that's my theory on why it keeps working. And I have to give credit to that again to Philip Anderson, who I've had direct conversations with on this. Um, in a previous discussion for my with my clients on the future of the real estate market but yeah i think this concept is fairly interesting it's just um it's it's these similar collections of debt and supply relative shortfalls and surpluses and demographics and they all intersect to create a surprisingly predictive pattern for real estate markets um I think also why it's more effective in the Anglosphere is because um, those cultures are more comfortable with speculating for appreciation, whereas other countries, maybe such as Germany or Japan, um, have more of a history of just saving money in the bank um, and just are less tolerant of volatility, whether it's from their financial markets or from their views on risky behaviors in the business world, such as entrepreneurship.